Hey, uh, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for being with us. And I will just get started. Today is December 1st. Uh, because the atomic mass of carbon is 12.01. So DOE also calls today as carbon management day. And also COP28 just got started. We will share some highlights in our newsletter and link it. So back to today's panel. In the last panel, we have two successful women with us today. We are very happy to interview two very successful men. And it's my honor to introduce them. Uh, Bob Bridge, founder of Swan Impact Network and co-founder of Samira Climate Fund. Bob has extensive experience in funding and taking early stage startup to successful exit. He had found a company and raised 60 million and returned to the investors for 30 million. And before that, he had served as a VP and a general manager of a public company. Uh, Bob, welcome. Thank you for, for being with us. Do you like to talk about Swan and why you uh, started the Climate Fund and your perspective? Thank you for that kind introduction. So uh, I, by training, I'm an electrical computer engineer. I spent most of my career though in the business side of technology companies and the bulk of that in startups. And um, always it was always hard tech things that required a lot of money, like semiconductors. You mentioned the amount of money I had raised. And I've always had a deep concern about the environment, about people being treated well, the people are being cared for. And so I, I with, with Juan Thurman's help, created the Swan Impact Network in 2016. It's an angel network with chapters in Houston, Dallas, and Austin. And we have 85 angels. We've invested $14 million. The bulk of that in climate tech companies. So we're looking for companies that have impact either on society or the environment. And if, um, Jesse, if you want to show that one slide briefly, that would be helpful maybe at this point. So you can see uh, we've invested across a number of different companies. A number of these are, and there's a, Advanced Ionics is a green hydrogen company. Uh, a number of these are in the solar space, Bodhi, Elevation, um, Yada. Uh, there's others which are doing wind power, recycling, and maybe our strongest company, Clearflame, is allowing diesel engines like a long haul tractor trailer cabs to burn clean renewable biofuels. So we have a, a broad, we had a broad look at environmental companies since 2016 and, have, and excited about these 12 companies. We also had uh, uh, an exit in this space of a company that improved the fuel efficiency of tractor trailer trucks. So uh, with working with Juan Thurman, we've also put together a venture capital fund focus exclusively on climate tech. You can take this slide off now if you want to, Jesse. Yeah. And we are, it's, it's a, 12, a $10 million fund. We're still closing the fund. We've made our first investment. But you know, we're looking for seed investments that are consistent with uh, uh, you know, a smaller fund size. We're not gonna be doing you know, million dollar investments. And so we're very selective as to uh, who we invest in. Uh, saying that, we are very well connected with the uh, Texas uh, you know, climate tech community, well connected with climate tech communities across the country. So we have a lot of focus on uh, and, you know, Texas companies. We have a lot of focus, we have a lot of support for companies founded by underserved founders, people who have historically been excluded from funding. And so when we look at the market opportunities uh, that kind of fit this model of the seed investment for the fund, 
you know, we, we like words, maybe some things we don't like, you know, battery technology is hard. There are so many scientists working on the next generation batteries. And we think it's gonna take those, those new technologies 15 years to really have an impact in the marketplace. There'll be a lot of people who have something interesting, but you know, getting access is hard. You know, I, I think that direct carbon, direct atmospheric capture of carbon is a very interesting technology, but not for a sea level company. You know, to have a real effect there on the environment, it's gonna require billion dollar government investments. And for a, a, a very young company to have their technology chosen to be the key of a billion dollar investment is really tough. So we're, we're not so uh, interested in that type of technology. We're not really interested in marketplaces where, okay, we're gonna help consumers choose their electric power supplier, if they're more green, or a marketplace that allows consumers to buy greener uh, appliances. Um, yeah, and so those are some areas that we also don't like when the government when the market only exists because of government subsidies. The government subsidies can go away in a couple of years, mm -hmm. a year or two. And and we all know that residential solar is in a doldrum right now because interest rates have gone up. And that business was was focused by uh, was driven by uh, inter low interest rates. So what do we like? We we like it when there's you know, in, industrial and, and commercial applications, especially industrial, where they can reduce CO2 emissions at the source, rather than trying to capture it later. Can you go into a factory and have a cost-effective way to keep CO2 emissions down? We like it when there are ways to improve the uh, energy efficiency of industry, industrial plants, commercial plants, residential plants whether that's, you know, supporting heat pumps for residential hot water heaters or, um, you know, increasing the efficiency of buildings, increasing the efficiency of commercial air conditioning. Those are all very interesting. Anything that lowers the barriers to acceptance of green energy that can be done without huge capital investments, we like those. Water is important to us. So if there's ways to produce and, and clean up water more cheaply, cost-effectively, we think that's important. And uh, you know, re remediating or preventing, preventing pollution is all interesting. So um, you know, we like companies that don't require a huge investment or CapEx by the users. You know, if you go into a factory, say you can take 30% of your CapEx next year to use our technology, that's probably a non-starter for most factories. So you know, reasonable CapEx kind of requirements. So you know, that's sort of a, a high level how we think about investing. Uh, we welcome to uh, answer questions on that later. I'll turn this over to, to Thomas uh, Ortman now for his intro and let him speak for a few minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pam is the president of Nose Energy and founding member of Clean TS Foundation. Uh, Thomas has 40 years in the engineering design and field sector with electromechanical engineering design expertise in electronics, clean technology, and semiconductor product and capital equipment experience. He founded Concurrent Design, which led to a merger with Volta Box of Texas. And then he turned into the CTO of Volta Box of Texas. Thomas, thank you. And could you share more about T, uh, Clean TS Foundation and also your current focus? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Thanks for the introduction. So, uh, yes, yeah, so similar to Bob, my background is engineering. Uh, I'm not electrical like Bob. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I've spent my entire career working in technology development, new product development, generally speaking, which had a lot of semiconductor equipment background that led us into a lot of uh, solar energy, some wind energy, uh, some microgrid, and ultimately into batteries where my company, Concurrent Design, uh, then attracted some interest from a, a European company, Voltabox, and they acquired my company, Concurrent Design. 
Um, I spent some time there as the CEO of both those companies and then uh, finally the CTO of VoltaBox. And uh, now I am uh, running a, you know, a, a sole proprietorship consultancy. Uh, I have been uh, active, very active for many years with the Clean Techs Foundation, Clean Techs Organization. And uh, that uh, focuses to promote clean energy and clean technology. Uh, I have been asked to serve on the uh, Austin Technology Incubator as an executive in residence. And I work with them uh, in terms of uh, many startups. Uh, primarily, my expertise is in the clean energy and clean technology space. So we can talk about that. And um, and so that's, that's uh, I guess, the, 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 the sum of my background. Um, I think that uh, the discussion that we wanted to have today, Jesse, was uh, regarding the electrical grid. And if it makes sense, I can I can talk about that a little bit as a as an as an opener for that discussion, if that works, Jesse. Yeah, um, in November, we have talked about the biggest picture and some important topics. And today, so the topic is mainly about the infrastructure supporting this energy transition, we are electrifying everything. So there might be a uh, uh, great congestion. Uh, there might be uh, some risk of uh, like a slow permitting or a slow policy and or lack of infrastructure because building transmission lines could take years. And even we build a lot of renewable energies, but they are not connecting uh, to to the, the the users, but in the big background is this energy transition and extreme climates and also rapidly rising computing demands. So um, all this uh, we, we we want to categorize these kind of challenges into two buckets. One is risk, the other is opportunities. So risks are not that not we can we we can not that we can change like a policy or politics and opportunities are something that we can change, especially those less vulnerable to the above risks. So thank you, Thomas, uh, for starting with the topic with about the grid and also share with us about the opportunities in, around this. Sure, sure. So I, you know, when, when I am looking at investments, I start with the very highest level. What what are the general uh, mega trends that are happening, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. around this industry space? And so if we think about infrastructure and specifically the electrical grid and all of its widespread infrastructure, um, we spent 140 years building this machine, the biggest machine mankind has ever built. And we are now facing a very rapid total revamping of that machine. And so we have all manner of new technologies being introduced into this. And a lot of those technologies go to efficiency. So if we think about the grid, you have a machine which sits there on a daily basis and runs in a sinusoidal function. It has uh, peaking uh, um, duty cycles, if you will, in the afternoons, and it has the trough of a duty cycle in you know the the early morning, three four a.m. And so, what we have is, by my estimation, as an engineer, a very inefficient system. We designed the ERCOT grid, for example, to be able to satisfy a peak load, but it very very rarely runs at a peak load. But when it does you know, you better be able to handle it. So how do we create a machine that can run closer to something that we might call steady state, where you turn it on and it runs at essentially a flat line and somehow all of the loads and demands and generation that's going on is, is, um, is being flattened to represent more of a straight line rather than a sinusoid. All of the generators that contribute to that, the, the nuclear, that's a straight line. The coal used to be a straight line. Today, it's a very jagged line, and that's its own problem. And every time we hear the word problem, we naturally you know, ponder opportunity. 
Uh, and for me on the clean energy side, then the solar, which runs on its own sinusoidal generation input, uh, along with the wind, which is much more jagged, but also generally sinusoidal, um, can be coupled with battery energy storage. And so we've all heard a lot about that. Um, we understand it, but I don't know how deeply we can get into some of the nuances of that. But uh, to me, I look at the grid as an enormous opportunity for the electrification around everything. And how do we complement that, supplement that, satisfy those requirements? Uh, there's a lot of discussions. Um, a lot of them revolve around energy, but how are those energy technologies made manifest on the grid? Uh, I want to dig into that some more, but I want to give Bob a chance to, to comment here now. Uh, those are all great comments. And you know, one of the things that's unique about Texas and ERCOT is that ERCOT allows new transmission, allows new generation capacity to come on, even if there's not transmission capacity to move that electricity around. The rest of the country, you can't bring on new generation unless the transmission is there first. And so we have this unique situation in Texas where a lot of the renewables, wind in West Texas or solar, our, our transmission capacity starved at times. Uh, we looked at a very interesting company that said, hey, we recognize that when people design transmission capacity, that they build, you know, for this peak, they build redundancy in. And typically, you know, the, the grid is only run at half capacity. So there's, there's, you know, at the peak, it can handle it. Or if there's equipment failures, they can handle it. But are there ways to, to use more of that grid uh, efficiently in real time, not not hold half of it back for emergencies or redundancies. Um, there's technologies that allow people to maybe forecast exactly how much capacity in the grid is being used and how how to turn on generation in real time to match the idle times of the transmission lines. Uh, you know the battery technology. I was I was being fairly negative about that. That's in terms of early stage battery technology companies. Uh, you know, storage is, is quite important and there's a lot of interesting approaches to that. But what I was saying is that if there's two research scientists at a university, you have a slightly different uh, chemistry for batteries, they think will improve efficiency by 20%. That's a hard thing to get into the marketplace. There are so many professors around the country trying to address exactly that same challenge which one will be the winner? We can't pick that out. We can't identify that as an investor. And they'll, they'll, many of those will, will not get traction. But you know, battery technology, Tom is exactly, exactly right. It's certainly important in terms of, of leveling out the, uh, the uh, sinusoidal and transmission lines. Batteries are important. There may be some hydroelectric, uh, hydro storage things, other some thermal storage technologies. All those are interesting to think about. So if we if we dive a little bit deeper into the word storage, when we hear storage, when most people hear storage, they think about batteries. And so let's let's bifurcate just for a moment here. The largest storage medium on the grid right now is hydroelectric power. Hydro all by itself and then specifically pumped hydro storage. These represent the largest energy storage capabilities on the grid, but there are many others. We have uh, compressed air energy storage. We have a company here in Austin called Active Power that has a flywheel kinetic energy storage. There are other companies uh, that are doing gravity energy storage. They put um, concrete blocks on uh, on winches and when the energy is available they raise them up and when you need energy you lower them down and they're building you know gigantic warehouses uh, full of uh, concrete blocks to raise and lower uh, many other technologies uh, superconducting magnetic energy storage is particularly interesting and it is in fact the only energy storage technology smes superconducting magnetic energy storage which actually stores electricity 
nothing else actually stores electricity. We store water, we store electrochemical energy, we store mechanical energy, but uh, SMES actually stores electricity. So um, there are a lot of applications out there, but as Bob pointed out, the difficulty of getting a new chemistry for a battery, for example, into a, a scaled operation, it's, it's incredibly hard. And you look at what Tesla has done to bring about uh, a very highly scaled battery operation to be able to sell their cars at, at accessible prices because of scale. And you scale because you focus on one technology and there are probably a hundred different electrochemistries available to batteries. And will any of them ever make uh, strides? M maybe. Um, nickel magnesium or nickel manganese cobalt technologies today are lead, they're starting to be supplanted by lithium iron phosphate because of the availability of supply materials. Um, lithium ion air or lithium air batteries, uh, sodium ion batteries, these are probably the leading candidates to me, but they're years away. And so I, I, I hesitate to you know, think of those as, as viable investments. But there are some other places that are much closer to reality today. And so uh, virtual power plants, V to X technology. Um, these, are, these are spaces that I think are incredibly important and uh, warrant a, a good rigorous study uh, for investment potential. And um, if you don't know what VPPs and uh, V to X is, we can discuss those some more. But those are places that I have particular interest and I spend a lot of time looking uh, looking at these. Yeah, I uh, I do a slide if um, people would not, not familiar about VPP or DER or V two X. Yeah, can look at this slide. So um. The whole picture of the electricity is about from generation transmission to distribution to behind the meter. Um, Thomas, would you like to like uh, talk more about this uh, whole picture and and how does this VPP and DER work and when will the VPP uh, become a mainstream? Um, today, today it's becoming mainstream. So a, a DER, distributed energy resource, uh, this can be anything that stores energy that can be called upon in demand, and it is generally distributed as opposed to centralized. So a coal-fired power plant, a nuclear plant, even a, a solar farm is a centralized generator. Distributed energy resources would be the... Um, the Tesla Powerwall in my garage, the solar system on my roof, the battery pack in my car, and those same assets distributed to thousands and tens of thousands and millions of people throughout the grid. And what is needed then is an aggregator. So in the city, uh, well, in ERCOT, not just the city of Austin, but in ERCOT, we now have uh, two ADERs, Aggregated Distributed Energy Resources. And this is essentially the same thing as a VPP. So DERs become part of a virtual power plant. And today, Tesla Electric has two ADERs, A-D-E-Rs, or virtual power plants, same thing, uh, running in the state of Texas as pilots. And ERCOT has uh, authorized, I believe, eight ADERs to run within the state. Two are up and running. They are, I think, about a megawatt of, uh, of power generation on demand. And, and essentially, they are um, emergency backups when there's a quick little blip in the grid. And you have a... Uh, an aggregator, in this case, Tesla, but there are others uh, who say, okay, we have, you know, this, this one megawatt of power available and we're going to sell it when the power demands are high and the prices are high. 
And so what we're doing, going back to my sinusoidal grid inefficiency discussion, is we are making the grid much more efficient by being able to fill in some of those gaps and, if you will, run closer to a, a straight line steady state that any good engineer wants his machine to run at. So these technologies are spaces that I find really intriguing, a great place to go in and explore and understand. Um, and we, all of us, can participate in this. We can you know, buy a power wall, connect it up, and Tesla will send you a check, uh, monthly, quarterly, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, they will send you a check back for the energy that you provide to them at very high prices on the grid. And it actually can become a, um, a source of revenue. And it remains to be seen as to the potential for a business model and a business investment. But to me, it makes absolute sense technologically. And I fully expect these will happen and happen very quickly. Important side note, transmission is not generally an issue with these technologies because these are local. We're not getting this energy from uh, you know, uh, a, a nuclear plant in South Texas or a coal plant uh, you know, out to the West somewhere or to the East. So you say the opportunity, the timeline is actually now. It's not too far. <laughs> It is, it, is, it is going on now. These have started here in Texas and they're starting in other places. California has VPPs or ADERs. Tesla had one in London. So these are here, they're real. And, and here's a, a, a tiny snippet. Um, I ran some numbers and I don't remember the specific details, but Tesla has sold over 4 million vehicles. If each one of those has a 65 kilowatt hour battery, and if you aggregate those and you make that energy available to the grid yeah. and, and you leave the owner of that vehicle some buffer for his personal needs, of course, you have a greater generation capacity than the entire United States nuclear fleet, which is about 100 gigawatts. And the Tesla fleet is larger than the entire US nuclear fleet in terms of its instantaneous power generation capability. And you can run your own numbers on that, but it's, a, it's an extraordinary resource which is not being utilized. And therefore that screams opportunity to me. Yeah, so sounds like opportunity is really about this distributed, uh, decentralized end of this electricity market. Uh, Bob, would you like to add your comment to this? And maybe uh, some of your investments are in this area? I don't have any direct investments in DER at the moment. Uh, well, I mean- Hey, wait a minute, what about Yada? Well, I was <laughs> yeah. gonna say it doesn't go back to the grid is what I was saying. You know, Yada puts for industrial and commercial rooftop they put batteries under each solar panel and that's available to, you know, in the evenings when the sun's gone down to power the building internal requirements. Part of a DER, I wasn't aware of that, but uh, it's certainly distributed storage. Right. It's, it sounds like you need to go speak with, uh, with Omid and and see if they couldn't capitalize on that and make that a revenue generating potential. Yeah, Yada is is a really really doing well as a company. We are excited about their progress. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have uh, used thirty minutes now, and uh, our speakers uh, promised to stay um, another thirty minutes for Q and A. So. It's time to raise your question. Maybe unmute yourself and ask your question. Juan Thurman made the comment that Yada will at some point return power to the grid. It's up to the building owners to uh, work on that kind of relationship with the grid. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, if while we're waiting for questions to pop up, think think about this. The average um, person 
in America drives their car less than 35 miles a day. Their average utilization rate of what is probably their second largest asset after their home only has a utilization rate around 5%. And so we have this asset, your car, and if it's an electric car, and if it's fully charged, it represents a woefully underutilized asset that could, and in my opinion, should be um, capitalized upon. And that's what VPPs and ADERs do with that distributed energy resource in the battery in your car, getting free energy from the solar system on your roof. So the V to X is actually not too far also. Uh, v to X is also here. V to X oh. is, is real, it exists today. There are companies doing this. Um, they are uh, working today mostly with Nissan Leafs because uh, the Leaf is designed for a bi-directional energy flow and it can be done virtually with any electrical um, battery energy storage system. So yeah, it's, it's real, it exists today and there are companies doing it and uh, another area of great interest to me personally. Yeah, I'm pasting, I just paste the, the link that uh, Thomas shared with me uh, about the uh, ADA. So I see some question here. <clears throat> Tim has a question. He's had his hand up. Oh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your time and I appreciate your presentation, uh, Thomas and Bob. Uh, by way of just a quick uh, background, or I also come from a engineering background, I'm an electrical engineer uh, by uh, training and profession. Uh, so, you know, this is very interesting discussion. Thank you, it was quite informative. Uh, I'm dialing here from uh, Canada and, you know, uh, yeah, there's a, a lot, I think that could be said about electrical grid modernization and just uh, microgrids and micro generation and, and storage as well. Um, I guess my question is, to both of you, like in terms of the next, uh, let's say three to five years, what would be sort of the biggest, uh, for lack of a better term, pain points for, uh, you know, our grid to be modernized? Barrier or? Yeah, uh, I guess. I'll pass that to you, Tom. Okay. All right. Sure. So, um, you know, today in, in ERCOT, and uh, I, I can't speak to the other two grids in the U.S., but in ERCOT, transmission is a pain point. It is a very serious pain point. When George Bush was governor, he signed the CRES legislation. That's the, I think it's Combined Renewable Energy Zone. And it allowed for a lot of transmission to be built from West Texas, where there's a lot of energy, and that energy is natural gas, uh, it is solar, and it is wind. And those generators are able to ship their energy to the population centers in the east, Fort Worth, Dallas, Waco, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston. And, and that transmission capacity is now fully subscribed. So during peak times of demand, there's no room left on the lines to send more power that's where battery technology becomes really interesting because when the wind generators are turning uh, in the middle of the night and nobody wants that energy, it's going to waste today unless there are batteries on hopefully both ends of the transmission line so that they can capture the energy in West Texas, they can ship it at 3 a.m. to batteries here in East Central Texas. And, and make it available upon demand. And here's, here's a figure which screams to me. In April of 2023, the state of California all by itself um, uh, had 700,000 megawatt hours of energy from wind and solar which they um, did not use. I'm forgetting the word for a moment, curtailed. It, is, it was curtailed meaning they didn't need it, they didn't use it, it was kicked to the curb, and 700,000 megawatt hours in that one month was lost. 
that is an inefficient system that screams for attention, battery energy storage, VPPs, aiders, uh, vehicle to grid, all of these things will work to solve that problem and fill in these, these horrendous gaps of inefficiency in the system today. So um, I saw Paul has a question about when is California expected to use ADER networks in a material way? So um, I mentioned uh, that ADERs are active in California. California is very progressive. They, they had uh, until very, very recently the largest um, uh, implementation of solar energy, uh, wind less so. Texas has been a leader there for a long time and Texas just per surpassed California in this. So um, ADERs also make great sense in California. There's lots of electric vehicles there. They are piloting these today. The question is in a material way. Well, I'm going to speculate that as soon as these pilots have proved themselves to uh, the, um, the ISO, California ISO, that they will be implemented on a broader scale and then people will be able to plug their 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 cars and their power walls and their home residential storage into uh, an aggregator, a utility type firm who organizes and executes on the signals saying, you know, hey, Tom, your car has got an extra, you know, 20 kilowatt hours of energy. Can I buy it from you in advance? They have contracts for this stuff. Um, and you know you've already agreed to it, and so they they take that energy out of your car. Um, interestingly, curiously, Bob, you mentioned the the battery element of this. One of the hesitations that people have had is, well, what is that going to do to my batteries if they're constantly charging and discharging my batteries, totally independent of my driving to work? What does that do to my batteries? And so Tesla and others have been hesitant to um, increase the duty cycle of the battery by calling for it, you know, many more times a day than would normally run through one charge and discharge cycle. That concern is starting to go away. And it's actually very important in this because if we have high confidence in the ability of our batteries to sustain themselves through the life of the vehicle, then we don't care about the battery question anymore. And if we don't care about it, we're more inclined to sign up with a VPP or an aider. And that will also be a, um, a tailwind to the entire adoption in California and every place else, Paul. Well, do you have more comments or questions? Uh, I guess the question is: Is do you, do you think that at the the beginning of wide scale adoption might be a year away, or something like three to five years away? I'm just trying to get your sense, your opinion as to the beginning of wide scale adoption in California, and then maybe other Texas or anywhere else if you have an opinion. Well, the fact that the pilots are going on today in both California and Texas, and and possibly other places in the country, I'm I'm not aware of any. Um, you know, I would guess in about a year, the pilot will say, okay, we've gone through, you know, four seasons, heat and cold in particular, you, you want to have an understanding of the effects of, of um, thermal implications in the system. Uh, and if it's successful, then I would think it would be rolled out and would start to grow, you know, like a lot of things with new technology, it'll start out slow, but it'll be available for mass consumption and mass subscription. And, uh, you know, three years from now, it'll become something that people are aware of. And five years from now, it'll be common. Yeah. I saw uh, Remy raise his hand. Remy, would you like to ask your question? And I know you are very interested in the decarbonization of building. Yep, that, that would be me. Uh, can you guys hear me well? Barely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of out. So here, I'm going to try this maybe. Hopefully, it's not no, you're, back you're, on you're better now. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, so my background is in building decarbonization. I focus quite a bit on the pre construction side, 
uh, more to do with how manufacturers perform their life cycle assessment. So it kind of rang a bell when you mentioned that what can manufacturers do to reduce their carbon emissions from the very core of their process, uh, which is very much what LCAs look at is they analyze that and or systemize it and, and form data sets out of them. But what I'm more con- interested about is when you were jump, well, kind of mentioning building operations and sort of how you know the path to, to electrification can sometimes be challenging for building owners, right? I mean, when they look at the investment they need to make now and so on. And so I wonder what's your take on sort of pathways to implementation that that you see, you know, whether it's some kind of regulatory force. Uh, that helps you know encur- encourage action today. Um, that that could help building owners today, especially in areas where there aren't mandates. So really, my question is more so about like what are you seeing, maybe in the works that could help maybe a mandate that that kind of you know encourages building owners to take action now, or just relatively any other like general insights and what can happen now for people to be incentivized. Uh, you know, New York City has regulations that require older tall buildings with single pane windows to get more efficient energy efficient in terms of the windows and we've seen the company is doing doing some work there you know it's interesting if if a building is owned by privately by the occupants they have a different type of roi calculation and if it's a commercial developer who's going to flip the building in three years and so uh, if a company says um, I have this building I can retrofit and, and save a million and a half a year. So it cost me $5 million to retrofit it. And then, you know, if they plan to be there for four years, they break even. After that. But if it's a building operator who says, hey, I'm just trying to keep this thing, this, this place attractive, keep it full of tenants so I can flip it in three years, there's not a big incentive to invest a lot. Uh, right. New buildings, certainly, there's a lot of opportunity to go into the cost effective solutions. Uh, at the at the get go at the beginning to improve efficiency, we're looking at a company now that's doing it on the air conditioning side that uh, has a way to reduce moisture content before it gets into the AC system, which can greatly improve the efficiency of the chilling units. So, um, yeah. One other aspect, uh, Rami, might be look at lighting as a pathway. Uh, Incandescent light bulbs, I believe, were about 12% energy efficient. LCDs were, I think, in the 80%. And LEDs, uh, I'm sorry, CFLs, were about 80% efficient. Uh, LEDs are in the 90, 92%, I think, efficiency. And so, um, the fact that you have much greater energy efficiency to make the same light, you spend a lot less money on energy, and those things become a, a cost component, an economics component. There was also the policy component where uh, I believe it was the U.S. government started to provide a roadmap to uh, not selling incandescent light bulbs over a certain period of time. And maybe over 10 years, we went from incandescence to CFLs to LEDs. I think you're going to see the same kind of thing. And you know things like heat pumps for your home air conditioning and heating just make perfect sense to me. It's a way more efficient system. Um, you're going to see the same thing with induction stoves. I don't have one, but the people I've spoke to that do, they, they love them. And it's it's pretty interesting to see that kind of transition, sort of like a you know, an uh, an internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle. It's a very different experience. The people who have an electric vehicle, you know, pretty much will never go back to an internal combustion. I imagine it's going to be the same thing in terms of home and, you know, commercial um, electrification. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, Yep, that all makes sense. Thanks, Chris. And Chris? Yep. Do you hear me good? I'm yeah. I'm driving right now, so I'm sorry if it's a bit of noisy. It's an electric car though, so <laughs> I hope it's very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and also sorry for being late. I hope it I didn't miss it, but I heard a lot about battery storage and other storage uh, capabilities and, and technologies, but I haven't heard anything about hydrogen. I'm a big um, hydrogen promoter and uh, with all the recent Biden uh, grants for the hydrogen hubs that are coming. 
I was wondering what you think about hydrogen as a storage media for um, these off peak or these peak situations where you need to store energy. Is that a viable solution that you think, or is it more like too inefficient? Go ahead, Bob. I don't know about the storage side, but we do have we have made an investment in a hydrogen generation company that's taking waste heat in an industrial facility and using that to very efficiently, uh, you know, create hydrogen for their internal processes. So that's an example of a sort of a closed loop system inside one facility where there's a fairly you know, immediate kind of return on investment. And, and we, we certainly see opportunities like that. Hydrogen, long-term is gonna be very interesting. It's gonna be a long time before you see long haul tractor trailer trucks that are electricity based because the weight of the batteries for you know, trucks that travel 240,000 miles a year doesn't work. And hydrogen, I think, has a role to play there potentially, as does the investment we made in clear flame engine technology that allows them to diesel engines with minor modifications to use uh, renewable biofuels and decrease the carbon footprint dramatically. And, and Chris, I want to add, I'm going to flip what you just said upside down. Personally, I don't see hydrogen contributing very much to the grid. I do see the grid contributing very much to hydrogen. I mentioned a few minutes ago, 700,000 megawatt hours, which is a stunningly big number of, of renewables in California in one month, April of 23, were curtailed. Those 700,000 megawatt hours could have been turned around and fed into electrolyzers to generate hydrogen. So I don't see the grid being served by hydrogen generation. It could be like a peaker today, a gas, natural gas peaker. But I see the grid being a component of a much more efficient machine wherein there is available energy on the grid that would otherwise be curtailed. It is not curtailed, but it is used to generate hydrogen, which can then be sold so that those wind and solar assets are not being uh, burdened with a, a low uh, capacity utilization rate. On the hydrogen side, I'm, I'm really interested in hydrogen, but I'm not really interested in it in a lot of the places that like Toyota is. I don't see light duty vehicles ever becoming hydrogen. It's a, it's a redundant system. We have gasoline and we have electric. We don't need fuel cell light duty vehicles. The place that I see it being really important in transport, not in the grid, but in transport would be maritime applications because of the energy density of the hydrogen for transoceanic transport near to shore ships, lit literal shipping, they call it. Uh, I see that being uh, electrified, probably possibly fuel cells and very likely a combination of the two as a hybrid, but um, aircraft, aviation, maritime, perhaps uh, long distance rail and long distance trucking would take that hydrogen generated by the grid. But don't forget, and here is a really important investment angle that I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, white hydrogen, if you don't know the term, white hydrogen means hydrogen which is not generated by man through some fuel in some process. It is literally found in the ground. Until a few years ago, people commonly believed it didn't exist. Now we're starting to discover it all around the world. And in Mali, there is famously a remote town which has a hydrogen powered electrical generation plant, and they get the hydrogen right out of the ground in their backyard. Uh, in France, last week, there was a big story of a huge, massive hydrogen discovery. And uh, I calculated, I was interested, so I calculated 2.13 years of hydrogen that was just discovered in France to run the entire United States. 2.13 wow. years. Yeah, I'm I'm I allow myself to disagree with some of your statements. Um, as you know, 
Nicola is already working on trucks these days. They shipped their, their first trucks for hydrogen. Uh, with the Biden's uh, hydrogen hub, there's a lot more action going on with hydrogen for, as you said, um, truck and uh, transit, so larger uh, larger vehicles. Um, I, I share your, um, your kind of opinion on the Toyota approach. There are a couple of things that they do wrong in my mind, specifically around the the pressure that they're using in their car, which is so far off what the what the trucks are using and the Maritimes and everything, that um, the refueling stations just for the Toyotas are extremely expensive at this point in time. And I don't see that coming down if everybody focuses on buses and transits. I also agree with your statement on the um, uh, excess energy that it can be converted into hydrogen. That will be definitely happening. Uh, but where I see the biggest benefit of hydrogen is uh, the climate tech and the green aspect, right? The green hydrogen, um, using electrolyzers and building it from green uh, energy is much greener than batteries or gas or all these other things will ever be, right? Um, batteries are not very green at this point in time. In fact, they're very um, in the production phase, very very CO two intensive, and uh, that is overlooked a lot of times, right? During runtime, they're very efficient, they're very CO friendly, but in the production when, they, when they're produced and also the recycling is not very, very great, right? uh, batteries are not, um, not really a green technology at this point in time. So that has to change green. Um, and if you're looking at the, at the energy crisis, right, there, there are two aspects to it. One is we don't want to switch from a bad technology CO2 exposure to another one that is just as bad, right? Just because we electrify everything. that That's not the purpose of the green and the climate technology. We want to have a new way to, to save the planet and not <laughs> harm it in a different way, right? So I think there is a role for hydrogen in the energy space specifically around the VPPs that you mentioned in the microgrid areas where you have access energy as well. And then if there's a there's no peak demand from the grid, you store it at the microgrid uh, as well, right? And keep it there as a backup. So in my opinion, uh, hydrogen will play a much bigger role in the future and in the near future than um, I heard you saying. That's kind of where I'm disagreeing with you. I hope that's... Mm -hmm. that's um, Understandable. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure where we're disagreeing because I, I posited that uh, long distance trucking would use hydrogen. I, I don't see it being used for, for local trucking very simply because all of the infrastructure is there to be able to do it with electric for, for local trucking. So Amazon delivery vehicles, for example, you know, that's that's going to become universal, in, in my opinion. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on your other elements regarding the green elements of batteries and um, and uh, recycling of batteries. But let's let someone else get a question in here. It looks like Rami and Tim uh, have more questions. I just forgot to lower my hand. Apologies. <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. If it was physical, I would have probably not had it held up. On that side. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Um, as you know, you know, uh, as things become more electrified and, you know, there's more uh, cars like recently with the Cybertruck uh, being uh, released, uh, there's going to be greater demand uh, on the uh, electrical grid um, and greater demand in terms of infrastructure. So just wondering, uh, is there, are there any interesting technologies or um, startups that you think are sort of working on that problem? Um, there is one just by way of, yeah, just uh, information I, I'm looking into. It's in my due diligence pipeline. That's uh, extremely fast charging uh, technology uh, for essentially charging uh, vehicles in as little as eight minutes is, is the claim, but, you know, I'm still, still sort of uh, sitting down and working with sort of the material and uh, connecting with the founders to see uh, uh, the level of maturity of their product. Um, but yeah, just wondering what your opinion is on, on, on that uh, uh, extremely fast charging tech for electric vehicles. Well, that will that will certainly help encourage people to think about you know buying a car that they want to 
go long distance with. And you know, the question is, what's the does the distribution network provide enough electricity to fast charge a lot of cars at once? And where is the storage? Is can there be local storage that would help that process along? So we talked a lot about long haul transmission, but the local distribution is also challenged in all of this too. Yeah, very, very true. And so what you're starting to see, there's a company called Rove, R-O-V-E. You can look them up. They have just opened the first of a mega fueling station for electric vehicles in California. And they're opening up, uh, they've got quite a, a roadmap to open up a lot more. In order to be able to charge or to refuel I don't know, 40 uh, electric vehicles at once, you need a lot of power. And you can't get that power through the distribution grid and you can't get it at the demand cycles that they need. So they're putting batteries in to serve as the buffer, the capacitor in the system to be able to provide that energy as the, the buffer between the, the transmission grid, the distribution grid and the electric vehicle demand. So um, that's one challenge. I, you know, uh, we don't have time to get into a deep discussion of, of C rates for electrochemistry, but when you talk about eight minutes, that is now, um, that's about an eight C charge rate. And most electrochemistries cannot support a charge rate at that speed. And so, um, I think uh, LFP Karen and uh, the uh, nickel manganese chemistries uh, can uh, for short periods of time, and that's meaningful in this. But it could be that it's a short enough time that it that it lets it work. Um, we I don't want to get into third and fourth order elements here. Um, but, you know, I see two challenges to electric vehicles. One is how long it takes to recharge them. And two is the availability of chargers. Cost seems to be not an issue. And Bloomberg this week announced uh, some recent results on cell and pack costs, which have resumed their downward uh, trend. And uh, 2025 is still anticipated to be the $100 uh, per kilowatt hour um gold standard that everyone has been pushing for and looking forward to seeing when electric vehicles will become cheaper than ice across the board. And you can expect a landslide uh, at that point for the uh, electric vehicle market. I'm not sure that I answered your question, Tim, uh, but let, let me know. Yeah, no, I think that was that was helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, um, that was a very good conversation in this hour. I saw uh, John still have uh, raised and uh, but I know uh, Barbara is going to live in one minute. Um, how about uh, John? You can ask your question, and maybe let's see how much we can go through. Sure, sure. My name is John Costa. Uh, and my question relates to your aiders and uh, VPPs, and I just was recently at an event with a lot of real estate people, and they're saying that solar panels and battery. Uh, units on homes when they're trying to resell those homes are problematic because of uh, liens on the equipment that's up on the roof by the various corporations and companies that have installed them. Um, is there any place they could go to look for uh, payback and sell it based on its value, I think, to um, to the new buyer to take on those payments in order to get on an ADA or VPP and, and turn it into a revenue generating center as opposed to a, a cost that they're just having to absorb in addition to buying the house. So a couple of thoughts on that. And, uh, and Bob had to hop off for another meeting, but I'm, I'm, I'm free and available to speak a little bit longer. Um, so a couple of things. Um, there was a company called Sun Edison. It was founded by a fellow by the name of Jigger Shaw, who was a mechanical engineer, very interested in solar energy. But he made a fortune with Sun Edison because he created an economic model, the financial engineering that worked to be able to allow people to put in a solar farm or a solar system and uh, and to make the economics work. And so it becomes a financial engineering challenge. So 
Uh, John, I have seen studies that show a solar system can add significantly to the resale value of a home. I could show you my electric bill for years and years and years where I have paid zero because I generate more than I need and the city of Austin um, you know, compensates me accordingly. Um, <clears throat> but there is a real issue then if you're selling your home, but you don't own your solar system on your roof. There are ways around this, but there are probably business opportunities within that for people to be able to solve that problem. It's not an intractable problem, but it's a real problem, and you bring up a good point. Um, I know my brother who has a uh, a solar system from Solar City. He didn't want to put down the initial cash outlay, and so he did not pay for it outright. But he you know, he sees a benefit every month in his electric bill. He has the option to buy it outright and make it his own, but then the maintenance becomes his and he kind of doesn't want to deal with that. Not that there's a lot of maintenance, but when the squirrels chew on the wires, that's a headache, right? So um, the, uh, the solution, uh, I think, is a financial engineering solution. It also becomes, I think, a solution in terms of um, housing construction. And let me give you an example. In Southeast Austin, there is a place called Whisper Valley. It is a planned development community. And, and I don't know 200 houses, 300, I don't know, 500 something. It, you know, it's a significant number of houses. And they have two uh, geothermal heating loops and they provide the heating and the cooling for the entire development through their utility, this geothermal loop that they have. They also have solar. The houses are designed for solar. And so it's built into the community. It's built into the developer. And I'm sure that they have their buying, selling considerations, you know, fully uh, captured in, you know, in, in the legal documents for the house. So that's a, uh, you know, not a solution to what you said, but it's a future solution, certainly that developers would build this stuff in. And in my opinion, uh, which is also not a solution, but it is a future solution is just a zero net energy, zero net energy home. When a builder builds a home, he builds it to be zero net energy period, not like in Austin, zero net energy capable, but zero net energy, meaning you're still tied to the grid, but you generate, you know, a uh, hundred units of, of power during the month, you need a hundred units, you're at zero net energy, even if you're putting power on the grid at one point and taking it off the grid at a different point. That model, I fully expect, will become standard operating procedure because it's just logical and rational that if our homes can be zero net energy, they should be. Uh, in the meanwhile, these legacy systems that you raised the question on is, is a valid concern. And there are actually a lot of companies that work around the financial engineering aspects of this in commercial real estate PACE, property assessed clean energy, Maybe part of that solution, if you're familiar with PACE, uh, if you're not familiar, you may want to look it up. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a niggling problem, but it's not a big problem unless you're the guy trying to sell his house and you don't own the solar system. And, you know, that creates a, a question mark. What's the term you mentioned? PACE? P-A-C-E, PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy. And what it has to do with is, um, uh, I think, certain programs like for commercial industries to be able to put their clean energy system uh, as an asset associated with their house. And so it is, uh, you know, just captured under the assessment of the house and you can, you know, put it into your mortgage. So you buy a new house with solar on it from day one. That's all in your mortgage. You don't actually see anything having to do with, you know, your solar system. All you do is you, you pay for it over time and you get the benefits in your electric bill every month. Wow. That's a really good information. And you see uh, this financial engineering is also a proof of that <clears throat> financing is an important infrastructure. Thank you for the great question and, and the great answers. And especially thank you, Thomas.
for all the uh, rich information. Uh, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure. And um, um, I thank you uh, all for joining us today, I suppose. Jesse, thank you for organizing. Yeah. Thank you for all your time. We will talk next time. Thank okay. you. Very good. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Thomas. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.